You are the skydiver. <laughs> Let's pray real quick. We praise you and thank you, God, for the wonders of your creation. It's what an incredible, incredible thing that man did. How daring, how brave, how astonishing uh, it was for him to accomplish that great, great feat. We're glad that he lived. We're glad that nothing went wrong. It would have been ugly. But uh, he was well prepared. He was prepared to do what he did. And there was no turning back once he started. And Lord, uh, I want you to help me communicate this same truth to my brothers and sisters tonight through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <laughs> now that looked crazy, and to any of us, that was insane. <laughs> this video of Luke Akins, a skydiver, jumping at 25,000 feet with no parachute into a little tiny postage stamp of a net. <laughs> uh, he was ready. He had over 18,000 jumps in his career since the age of 16. He founded his own jump school, and currently he trains our special forces in technical skydiving. He had been preparing for this jump for two years. As I thought about his amazing feat, I saw some parallels between skydiving and our life here in Christ. And here's a question for you. What is the main point of jumping out of a plane? What's the main point of jumping out of a plane? Simple. Simpler than that. I'll just tell you. To reach the ground. That's the main point. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, for tonight's Bible study, the main point of jumping out of a plane is to reach the ground. In its simplest form, that goal is easily achieved by everyone who attempts it. In fact, I can confidently say that for all the history of aviation, everyone who has actually tried this maneuver has indeed reached the ground. However, if he plans to do it more than once, a man must prepare himself ahead of time. When it comes to living a life of faith in Jesus, what is the main goal? What is the simple main goal? Anyone? To get to heaven. Yes. <laughs> to get to heaven. And when a skydiver leaves his plane, his destiny is... The ground, yes, earth. And when a sinner leaves his sin and puts his faith in Christ alone for salvation, his destiny is heaven. But just as there is more to skydiving than simply leaving the plane and reaching the ground, so there is far more to the Christian life than just leaving one's sin by faith in Jesus and going to heaven. The skydiver must be prepared with excellent training, good equipment, and overall strength and health if he hopes to survive. Similarly, the duty of the believer who wants to serve well is to prepare his heart, his soul, and his mind for the adversities which Christ himself has said we must face, so that when he arrives in heaven, he might hear that most cherished of all welcomes, well done, good and faithful servant. But what happens to the skydiver who neglects to prepare himself sufficiently for the jump? Does he reach his destiny? He does indeed. He reaches the ground. But it's quite messy. How about the believer? If he neglects to prepare himself during his journey through this life, will he reach his destiny? He will. But there are many, there are many who arrive in a very poor condition. Don't let this happen to you. Once we have begun our new life in Christ, we are responsible to prepare ourselves for our arrival at our destination in the kingdom of God so that our arrival won't be messy. Tonight, I want to show you five truths in five letters which Paul wrote to help prepare the people of God for excellent service to Christ in this world, 
and to assure a grand arrival in the kingdom when we depart. I've only picked five. There are many, many more, but let's just go with what I have. The first is going to be the assurance of our salvation forever. We find that in Philippians. The second is the promise of total provision for all our needs, and that's going to be in 2 Peter. Third is the indwelling of Christ, which fills us with love, as Paul wrote about in Ephesians. And the fourth is the certainty of opposition and persecution. And in, for that, we'll look in Acts 20. The fifth is a warning to be on your guard, to be prepared, and to keep your head, as Paul wrote to Timothy in his first letter. So, for our first one, turn to Philippians chapter 1. While you're turning, the Philippian believers, like us, have begun their journey and have proved it first by showing their love towards Paul, by sending him a much-needed love gift while he was in prison. They, they rounded up a lot of money, and they sent it by messenger to Paul to help him and the other brothers who were with him in Rome. And the Apostle Paul was very, very thankful, and he offered great encouragement to the new believers while thanking them for their generous help, which they sent him. Then he presents to them our first truth, Philippians 1, 3 through 6. He says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. What a powerful, powerful assurance this is. When a man closes with Christ for eternity, he is secure forever. No one and no thing can unwork what Christ has begun in him, not even the man himself, if he wanted to. He has left everything behind and jumped into Christ. There is no going back to the plain. Romans 8.38 says, For I am persuaded that neither uh, death nor life Neither angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is faithful to ultimately finish what he started. Hang on to that. Hang on to it with both hands, with all you've got. It's very important to understand and believe that authentic salvation is absolute. The skydiver cannot unjump, and you can never be unsaved. The assurance of God's faithfulness to us is our greatest strength and the wellspring of our faith. Without this understanding, you will always struggle with doubt. I believe that's one of the greatest difficulties that Christians face today, that, that, that deep-seated doubt, because they're just not sure. They're not convinced that God is going to save them. They are saved. Their faith is in Christ, but this lingering doubt prevents them from resting on that truth. That's what you need to do. Rest on the truth that God is going to finish what he has done in your life He's going to finish one day, just as he promised, no matter what happens to you. With this, with this truth firmly tucked away in your heart, you can travel safely down the most perilous paths with confidence. But once the journey has begun, we have a limited amount of time until we reach our destination. And there are important things we need to be about. Remember that skydiver. He's on his way. He fell for two minutes, maybe? No, not even that. He's got a limited amount of time to do the things that he has to do before he must be ready to hit that net. So another proof of our security is in Ephesians chapter 1. Turn there, Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Paul writes... 
In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee or the deposit of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. There is nothing in all creation that's more solid than our salvation in Christ. God, by his own purpose, in verse 11, the counsel, his own counsel, and by his will, has done this. And having done this, he has sealed us and guaranteed what he has done by giving us his Holy Spirit. There's no way to get past that. This is permanent, and it's forever. And you should never fear that God will ever turn you out or reject you, no matter how badly you have fallen. When you fall, go directly to him. Tell him exactly what you've done. Confess it fully. Own it completely. And repent before him. Ask him for help. Ask him for strength. And then pick yourself up and move on. Don't stay there. Once you have dealt with your sin... Get up and move along. Too many people who have crashed really bad refuse to move on. They're going to stay there. They're going to sit by the racetrack and cry. They're going to curl up in a ball and go into a coma because they failed. The race is still being run. But they're on the side of the track, and some people, you just can't get them up. Confess. Repent. Receive God's forgiveness, and then get back on your feet and move along. Really important. That's hard to do, I know, on grievous sins. Easier to do on some of the the stupid things we do day to day. But it must be done quickly, efficiently and immediately, and then move on. For a second promise, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, where the Apostle Peter declares the truth of God's power for the believer. We've seen the assurance of our salvation. Now we're going to look at the power that God gives us. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given, uh, which by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Take a look at verse 4, and there's the word these. I think that's an important word because it's telling us to look back at something. Now, there's two things we can look back at. His divine power and knowledge. Or we can look back at his glory and virtue. Those are the two things we're looking back at. So it's one or the other, or it could be all four. But I picked out one over the other. I picked out that the word these is referring us back to his divine power and then knowledge, referring to our knowledge of him. My understanding of this verse, and the thing that gives me much hope in this world, is that God has graciously provided endless power for all our godly needs with no exception. 
And that power works in our lives to the greater or the lesser degree in direct proportion to our knowledge of him. Study your Bibles. Study to show yourself approved. There's a reason for it. God's power comes through our knowledge of him. Knowing him through his word and his spirit is how we participate with his divine nature. This is why we study him. This is why we meditate on his word. This is why we renew our minds by washing them in the word of God. The man who knows him little will have little power. But the man who knows him much will have much power. Only the man who knows God will be able to discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. People often ask, what does God want? What, what, what is God doing? Only that man who knows God will be able to, to discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. This power, which defeats our evil desires, is absolutely essential and completely available by faith to every spiritual skydiver who has begun his upward journey to the high calling of God. Get it. Get it. No matter what is going on in your mind, no matter what you are dealing with in this world, God's power and his word can overcome. Those are the things we struggle with the most, is what we think. The things, all these, these, this storm of thoughts that run through our mind all the time, throughout the day. It's really hard. It's, re it's really easy to get dis distracted. It's hard to keep our minds on the things of God. That's why we study. That's why I, I encourage people to memorize Scripture. Put it into your mind. You don't have to carry a Bible with you if you put it into your mind. You can flip to that page any time. Not just a verse at a time. Memorize chapters. Go for it. You can do it. Memorize chapters. Memorize long passages. Put them in your mind. It takes some effort. If I can do it, you can do it. It works well. And God always has that ready resource to pull out every time he's talking to your heart. He'll bring these things to remembrance if you've put them there for him to use. Okay, let's look at our third truth. And it's going to be in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. And there we'll see that the knowledge of God and the power of God with the indwelling of the Spirit of God launches us at great speed into the immeasurable love of Christ for his church. And Paul writes that, he would, uh, Paul writes that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Think of that skydiver again. Who of us wouldn't want to be filled with the measure of the fullness of God? When our skydiver left the plane, as soon as he steps out of this little shell that he's in, he suddenly became aware of the vast expanses of space around him. The whole sky is wide and long and high and deep, and he is a tiny speck in it. When we leap into Christ, we are instantly surrounded by the infinite volume of the love of Christ for the helpless sinner. The problem for us is that it is difficult to grasp. This is normal at first, and the new, uh, the new believer understands it at a simple level. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That simple truth of a Sunday school song is a great place to start, but we mustn't stop there. The power of the Spirit is the indwelling of Christ in our hearts through faith, 
And he wants to fill us with all the vastness of his love. Imagine, if you can, that the skydiver is no longer a speck falling through the expanse of the sky, but that all the sky, all the vastness of it, the height, the depth, the width of the sky, like the love of Jesus for his church, moves into the skydiver. He's no longer in the sky, but the sky is in him. Jesus wants to fill us up to the fullest measure with his love for us and our love for each other. For number four, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. There we're going to find a sobering truth of persecution and opposition from those who hate all things holy in this world. Paul says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now hold on to this verse a second. I'll come right back to it. But I want to talk about the devil for a second. I'll give you an example from a different Skydiver. There was another extraordinary event that happened a couple of years back. I wonder what it would be like to go ripping through the sky at 150 miles an hour. It must be very violent. But even this is small compared to the forces which he endured on October 14, 2014, when Felix Baumgartner, another skydiver, leaped from a balloon which had reached the height of 24 miles. This is the edge of space. He fell for almost four and a half minutes, reaching a top speed of 729 miles per hour. The forces that opposed him almost killed him when he began to tumble out of control, but he recovered his stability and broke the sound barrier sending an audible boom to the spectators watching many miles below. He wore a specially designed spacesuit which provided only his most critical needs. When he finally landed, he was hailed as the greatest skydiver in history. That is, until two years later when Alan Eustace, an executive at Google, did the same thing and beat him by 7,000 feet. I bring this up because uh, it helps illustrate the fact that the people of God who walk in the truth of Christ face fierce opposition. And though we may spiral out of control, God will always help us recover when we ask Him. We can live a holy life in this world at supersonic speed Because God, by His Spirit, has provided all that we need for life and godliness in this world. Let me say that again. We can live a holy life in this world at supersonic speed because God, by His Spirit, has provided all that we need for life and godliness in this world. There are times when Christians get really discouraged and they say, I can't do it. I can't overcome this. I can't change this. I don't know what to do. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I know that's very real. That's a very, very real struggle. And we all know what that's like. But God's word is true. He has indeed provided everything we need for life and godliness. It's there. 
Don't doubt it. In your greatest doubt, in your greatest fear, in your worst failures, remember this. God has provided everything that you need for life and godliness in this world. And I love the verse that that reminds us, His mercies are new every morning. I have had those days where I have utterly failed to an extraordinary degree on a particular day. And I met with God before I went to bed, and in the morning I woke up to a brand new mercy, a brand new grace, a newness of life, because I dealt with it. And God didn't bring it up. He didn't beat me over the head. He didn't remind me. And every time it kind of started whispering back up in my mind that next day, I ran away from it. Done. I dealt with that. God has forgiven me. God, I know that you dealt with me last night. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. So, with this power, we need to live our lives in such a way that it sends a sonic boom to that great cloud of witnesses who surround us and are cheering for us. Remember Hebrews? We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. When I was reading about uh, uh, Mr. Baumgartner and that sonic boom and the people watching, that's the image that came to me, is the people that are witnessing our lives, who have gone on before us, are cheering us on. And could you imagine living your life and uh, in, in, such a, uh, in such a fashion, trusting in Christ, growing in Him, serving Him in such a way that it sends an audible boom to those witnesses who are watching, and they stand and cheer. I don't know if that really happens, but it's a good picture. <laughs> the new believer, from the moment he leaps out of the plane, he has an adversary. This adversary is the devil. And he is a real person who really believes that murder is too good for us. He will oppose all our efforts to the degree that God allows him to. But the best news is that all his schemes have been exposed. We know what he does. We know his ways. We know his lies. We who love the truth, we know a lie when we hear it. Don't we? We know a lie when we hear it. And the greatest thing of all is that Jesus has broken the power that Satan had over us. He has broken the power that Satan had over us. And he has snapped the spine of sin in our lives. All of that's available. There's no reason to be afraid of the devil any longer. In Hebrews 2... Verses 14 and 15, the writer says this, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He came here, to live a life as one of us, God in the flesh. And in so doing, when he died on that cross, he destroyed the devil and the power that he had over us. Another great truth. Hold on to it, put it into your belt, and never let it go. When people talk about the devil doing these things, the devil getting involved in these things, in our personal lives, in our church lives, okay, that's... that's, one idea, and also the devil working in the world. That's a different concept altogether. The devil does run wild throughout the world, and he does horrible things throughout the world. But when it comes to the devil in our lives, he is a defeated foe. He is a defeated foe. He cannot steamroll us. Furthermore, we have weapons through our knowledge of the scriptures that enable us to defend ourselves and attack this mighty foe. What's our greatest weapon? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Sadly, though, the devil doesn't attack us in person. If so, it's extremely rare. But his attacks come through people 
over whom he has influence, which I believe is worse. Paul calls them evildoers and imposters. Evildoers are bad enough, but imposters are the worst because they are the ones who will pretend to love. They are false brothers, false teachers, and false prophets because they are deceived. They may actually believe, well, because they are deceived, they may actually believe that they are doing right even as they destroy individuals, families, and churches. Jesus warned us against them in John 16, where he says this, verses 1 through 4, John 16, 1 through 4. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues, yes. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. We're in that time, brothers and sisters. We're in that time. We're in that time. Unlike any other time, I believe, since the Lord went to glory, unlike any other time, we are facing that very thing now. But we can defeat the attacks of the devil by using the weapons and tools provided to us by our King and our Commander, Jesus Christ. I like the phrase, truth to a liar is like salt on a slug. We hold the truth in our hands. Here, it needs to be put in our hearts. I'll make another plug for memorization. Memorize Scripture. When we put the Word of God in our hearts, meditating on the Bible, meditating on the words of God, letting them wash through our minds, conforming our lives to the things we learn and understand, then we will be equipped for every battle inside and out. Remember the troubles that we have in our minds and the distractions and the things that, all that storm of thoughts that comes through our mind? We can battle those with the Word of God. How shall, how shall a, a young man make his way pure? But by living according to your Word, O oh Lord. The renewing of our mind. Have you abused your mind in your life? Is it burnt full of holes? Is it cut and scarred? Is it bruised? Renew your mind. Here it is. It's a cure. The very words of God put into your mind heal. They heal. Many, many millions of men and women have found this out. The testimonies are legion. People who have seriously encountered the Word of God and been serious about putting the Word of God into their minds and into their hearts, into their lives, are transformed. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul writes this, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Take a look back at 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you get your finger there. I left it a little while back. 2 Timothy 3, on verse 14, Paul told Timothy, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of. That's a powerful message for today because in the church, people are not listening to sound doctrine anymore. They're not continuing in what they have learned and what they've been taught. People are abandoning these things. Black and white, 
plain, simple words on white paper, clear instruction from our Lord, commands of the Lord, people toss them out. Give no regard to them with no fear of the consequences. That's shocking. I'd like to ask, I, I like to ask people what they believe about a certain matter. What are they convinced of and why? Get their mind working on these things. Some people ask me a question. What does the Bible say about this? And I'll ask them, what do you believe about it? And why? What is it did you believe? And how did you come to this conclusion? Get them moving, get them talking about it. This affords an opportunity to confirm the truth if they believe it, or to introduce the truth if they are willing to hear it. We can do this for people because, as he says in verse 15, uh, yeah, for, uh, verse 15 of chapter 3, um, because the Holy Scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Wisdom comes through the Word of God. People say, how do you know these things? The Word of God. I'm a normal person just like anybody else, but I know what is here. I know these things. I know what is true. The Scriptures allow us to teach and rebuke and correct and train in righteousness. And in verse 17... assures us that in this way, we are thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, on a sad note, we should understand that here at the very end of the age, where we live now, most people will not tolerate sound doctrine from us. Jason <laughs> talked about that on Sunday. People that, when you bring truth to, uh, to, to bear in their lives, they need to go to their safe place. <laughs> they run away from you and go to their safe place. They can't handle it. People will not tolerate sound doctrine from us. They don't want to know the truth because they don't love the truth. Consequently, they don't love us or our Savior. This is because they have rejected the Word, His Word, for their lives. These kind of people are filling up our churches. Not our church. Amen, sister. Not our church. So many churches have, have spiraled into great darkness. George Barna, from the Barna Research Group, he, he studies evangelical Christianity. There's a lot of surveys. It's fascinating. Go to his website. It's a fascinating read. So uh, George Barna uh, made a statement about the modern American church, and he says this, The Christian body in America is immersed in a crisis of biblical illiteracy. How else can you describe matters when most, not some, but most, church-going adults reject the accuracy of the Bible? They reject the existence of Satan? They claim that Jesus was a sinner, just like us? And they see no need to evangelize anyone. They believe that good works, their good works, are one of the keys to persuading God to forgive their sins. I'll do good stuff, God, if you'll forgive me for all the stuff I did. I'll just get out and start doing good stuff. Get on your good side. Catch you on a good day. Make you happy with me, and then maybe you'll forgive me. No. Complete rejection of the idea of grace. And they describe their commitment to Christianity as moderate or less. That's most people in our churches in America. I think it's these people who will give us the greatest opposition in days to come. Here's what Paul said as he was saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders for the last time. In Acts 20, verse 21, I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly, and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith 
toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. And in verse 29, he goes on to say, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch, and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone, night and day, with tears. Perverse things in the church. Does that describe the daily news? How many denominations have completely rolled over to the homosexual agenda? It's everywhere. It has infected, it has infected like gangrene through the United Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Episcopals, the United Church of Christ. Uh, it's moving towards the Catholic Church. It's, it's unbelievable this tsunami of perversion that is rolling over the church in America and around the world. Certainly a sign of the last days. For the last of the five truths to put in your belt, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. This is keep your head. Don't fall apart as things fall apart. You, keep your head. Paul writes, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. I mean, this is today's news and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Similarly, in, verses, uh, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it's a very, very similar passage right here. It goes right along with it, so I'll add it to it. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared, little skydiver, in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. I don't need a parachute. I'm going to jump the plane with that one. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. You don't need a parachute. Go ahead and jump. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. These are desperate times for the church. Millions have abandoned the faith to follow strange teachings. Bizarre and perverted things are now held in high esteem among many Christian denominations. And it appears, at least to me, that a great falling away is in full motion and it's speeding up. We need to keep our heads in these trying times. This is the fifth and the final truth for us tonight. Be on your guard. Be prepared. And keep your head screwed on tight. Just as Paul cautions Timothy in verse 5. Now in closing, I want to emphasize the good news that we are well on our way. You're right, this is a special church. This is a special church with a godly man who desperately loves Jesus Christ and holds the Word of God in high, high honor here in this church. We get a feast, a smorgasbord of the Word of God every time Jason stands where I'm standing now. He, it, he, de <laughs> he dedicates himself 
to many hours of study to present to us the Word of God unfiltered, accurately dividing it and presenting it to us, serving it on beautiful plates. And He feeds it to us in a loving way. What a great, great privilege we have in this little church. There are so many churches who are starving to death or have already died for the lack of the Word of God. So we're hurtling through this life at supersonic speed, and our destiny is the glorious kingdom of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church has traveled far and long for 2,000 years now, and we will soon be home. Praise God. This is no time to go to sleep like so many have done. Therefore, Paul says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that our deepest heart's desire? Is that Jesus himself will swing those doors wide open and greet us when we arrive. And I long to hear those words from him, well done, good and faithful servant. Unless he helps me, unless he gives me grace, unless he carries me, and sustains me, I can do nothing. But because he does carry me, because he does sustain me, because I am absolutely certain that what he has begun in me, he will carry it to completion. I have no reason to be afraid. I can deal what comes to me tomorrow. Because Jesus holds me, and he is faithful, and he'll never let me go. May it always be so in my life and yours until he comes for us or we go to him. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have worked an extraordinary thing in our lives. You have done this thing that takes our breath away, that you, Lord, have stooped so low to save sinners like us. Lord, the wonder is not that people go to hell. That's no surprise. The wonder is that anybody goes to heaven. The wonder is that anybody survives the horrors of this world and the grief of our sin. Lord God, you killed your own son to break the power of sin and death and to defeat the devil in our lives. And you have given to us this this gift freely with no cost for anyone who comes to you. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you so much that you suffered the cross, that you suffered the the beatings. We thank you, Lord, for the beatings. We thank you, Lord, for the nails. We thank you, Lord, for the cuts and the spittle. We thank you, Lord, for the tearing out of your beard and the piercing of your beautiful head. Lord, we thank you for the spear. We thank you, Lord, for the grief, the misery, and the sorrow that you endured as you hung there in the hot sun. We thank you for all that you did for us. It was beautiful. It was eternal. And it was powerful. And we are saved by you because of what you've done. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We want to be faithful to you while we live in this world. We want to serve you. It's hard. It's hard, Lord. You know. You've been here. You know what it's like. You know exactly what this world is like, and you know exactly what we deal with here. That's why you are our high priest. 
That's why you minister to us. That's why you understand us. It's so comforting to know, Lord, that you suffered just like we suffer and far, far more. But Lord, thank you for washing us clean. Thank you for washing our minds. Thank you for setting us on our feet and sending us down the road. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for your power. Lord, use us to bring glory and honor to your name because you are worthy of all of our praise and all of our worship and all of our service. That day is coming, Lord, where we will finally arrive at our destination. And Lord, our fondest desire is to arrive in such a manner that you will say to us, well done, well done, my daughter, well done, my son, well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, those words, oh Lord, to carry those into eternity is, is a greater joy than, than can ever be imagined. May it be so in our lives, Lord, as you give us grace each new day to walk with you. Apart from you, we can do nothing, Lord. But with you, everything is possible. You are our King and our God, and we worship you and praise you forever and ever. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen.